the sensations of warmth. And noticing what else is there and just being with it, being with yourself in a gentle way. So knowing that many more people will join us um, in the next few minutes, um, but also honoring that we are here now, um, I'd like to welcome you all. Um, thank you very, very much for taking time out of your busy lives um, to spend some time here as a group of people, a collect and a community to hear a Dharma talk. How wonderful. Um, we may not be on our own in our homes. We, I have three cats that are bound to disturb me from time to time. We may have husbands or children or wives or partners that have made themselves scarce and um, may actually look for some attention halfway through. And we can use that as a bell uh, to remind us to be uh, kind and smile and know that they are giving us their best also. So throughout the talk, we invite you to remain muted. And um, whilst you're sharing where you're from and your name in the chat, once you've done that, you can actually just pause using chat until you get an invitation later. Um, maybe you would like to have your camera on speaker view, or maybe you'd like to turn off your camera during the talk, and that's perfectly fine. And we are recording the, the talk. So if your internet fails during the talk, you will receive a full, a full talk later. So thank you very much and welcome. And continuing welcome. Uh, I'd, like you, I'd like to introduce you to Cara Duolingo, who is our teacher for today. She's a lay Dharma teacher uh, in the Plum Village tradition and previously was a nun in Plum Village for 15 years. She's now based in Colombo in Sri Lanka and she provides individual spiritual mentoring and leads many retreats nationally and internationally and offers mindfulness programs for educators, parents, youths in schools, also supporting activists, people of color, artists and families and um, is one of my mentors. I'm really delighted to share. Um, I met Cara Jewell maybe 15 years ago in EIAB, the European Institute of Applied Buddhism. And I met a person who was transparently, open-heartedly friendly. And that is what I continue to see today, which brings me great delight. And was one of the reasons why we invited her to talk uh, for the Irish Sangha and all of our friends worldwide. Um, yeah. And just a note on when I asked Kyra Jewell to, to offer a talk, immediately she said yes, and uh, let's find a date. And that's how easy it was, I'm really happy to say. And as a lay Dharma teacher, she's offering her time very freely for us uh, to participate in this talk. And as a lay Dharma teacher, she also actually has the same expenses as we do living expenses, the same health insurance, phone, call, phone bills as we do. And there is an invitation to offer a financial contribution to help support her and support her work. She spends many hours each week practicing so as to be able to offer talks like this. And um, if towards the end of the 
evening or tomorrow or the next day, you feel the tug of generosity in your heart, please feel free to go to her website or click on one of the links we've sent you and um, offer some financial dana of the heart. So thank you very much. And I hand you over to Carrie Jewell. Generosity. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, I really appreciate the warm welcome. And I really appreciate the invitation to come and be with you all. Um, so, yes, thank you for inviting me, Martin and the whole Irish Sangha. Um, I was telling our um, other friends who are helping to coordinate this evening, Sarah Jane and Jack, that my great grandfather is Irish, was um, Patrick Smith. Um, and so it was a, a really um, beautiful feeling to, to come there the several times that I came with Thich Nhat Hanh, with Thai to teach and lead retreats to feel the, the ancestral connection. And just warmest welcome to all of you, those of you joining from Ireland, those of you joining from the UK, those of you joining from the United States and France and Germany and Sri Lanka, like me, <laughs> and everywhere else. So I'll just let you know the plan for the evening uh, or the afternoon or morning, wherever you may be. So it's a two hour call and we'll begin by welcoming and honoring our ancestors in a brief ceremony. And then I'll offer us a guided meditation on the topic of um, holding our grief, opening to whatever um, might be here as we go through this time of pandemic. And then I'll offer some reflections, um, a talk also on, on grief and fear and cultivating compassion. I have a little wild cat that lives in the um, ceiling of my house. So it's uh, getting active at night. <laughs> um, and after the sharing, we'll have a little break, a little more than halfway through. Um, so you can take a bio break, take care of yourself, stretch. But at the same time, I'll offer some um, practices for calming the nervous system for anyone who wants to um, and I'm just getting a message that there's some difficulty with hearing are you are you can you give me a thumbs up if you're hearing me okay good okay I'm seeing lots of thumbs up okay oh you couldn't hear the cat thank you okay I was <laughs> worried you couldn't hear me Okay, that's good. You couldn't hear the cat. <laughs> My volume is low. Okay. Um, I'll try to speak up. Let me know if it gets better. If when I speak a little louder. Um, I'll do my best. I might need reminders to keep my volume up. So after the break, um, We'll have a little, uh, a short ceremony where we can bring to our, our circle of, of community um, the names of people or situations that we're grieving that we'd like to have held collectively. And we'll listen to a song as we um, write and acknowledge these griefs, these losses. And then the last half hour, we'll have question and answers. Time for um, you to ask questions. You can put them in the chat. 
And then um, we'll finish with some announcements, letting you know what will come next and um, a brief time of silence and a, a closing dedication. So that is the plan. So I want us to begin by um, just welcoming our ancestors. So at the start of any important ceremony in most Buddhist traditions, there's an offering of incense and it's a way of calling on the ancestors for support so that we recognize we're not doing anything of significance on our own, but that we need to call on all the supportive forces to join us and be with us. So I have a candle here with me. I'm not gonna light incense, but I'll light a candle and then we'll call on our ancestors to be here with us today. So we can light the incense of our heart. We don't have to have incense itself. So this is from a West African um, healer and teacher named Maladoma Somme, a prayer from the Dagara people of Burkina Faso. May all ancestors join forces to put good thoughts into our minds so that we may see the good that awaits us and accept it. I'll share that one more time. May all ancestors join forces to put good thoughts into our minds so that we may see the good that awaits us and accept it. So I invite us now to invoke, to call upon our ancestors who are our genetic blood ancestors, who are our spiritual ancestors, who are our land ancestors, those who've built up our land, our nation, to come and be with us as we practice together, to protect us, to guide us, to show us the way. So dear ancestors, we call upon your strength, your wisdom, your compassion, your courage, your ingenuity and equanimity. What we're encountering right now is more than any individual body can hold. We can't do this as individuals, meeting this time of pandemic, meeting the crises of climate change and economic depression. But we are not alone. All of our ancestors of all sorts are available to us. So I invite you to call upon your ancestors. So many of you in Ireland and in the UK and many other places around the world have survived devastating tragedies, civil war, famine, the plague, the Spanish influenza, world wars. That wisdom, that strength is in each of us from our ancestors, what they had to have in them to make it, make, make it through those difficult times. So we can call up all of this strength now for our own benefit and that of others. I had a chance to invite, I was speaking to a, a group of several hundred Italian Sangha members, practitioners, during the height of their coronavirus pandemic. 
And I invited, we practice this to call upon our ancestors and they were able to access the wise equanimous ancestors who had gone through very challenging times during the great flu of the 1918, 1920 time of the world wars. And when I shared this practice also with those in the US, a woman remembered her Jewish aunt who hid in a tiny attic for two years until she could escape Europe and come to the US. At times she had no food. She couldn't move around. It was a very tiny place she had to stay still in. But she survived and she went on to have a long and successful career as a doctor. A strong, powerful woman with great love in her heart. I wish I had remembered her name, but for me, she's also my ancestor now. She's someone I call on for strength, for support. So you, if you can borrow other people's ancestors if you don't feel a, a particular strong connection to someone in your own lineage. If there's a story you've heard of someone else, you can claim them as your ancestors. They're available to all of us. Just yesterday, I was offering a teaching for people of color Sangha in LA, Los Angeles, and an African American man spoke about having printed the images of all of his ancestors on a blanket, and that his practice in the morning is to wrap himself up in that blanket for his meditation. And he has all of his ancestors embracing him. And he contemplates that whatever I'm going through, it's not nearly as intense as whatever they went through. So if they got through their difficulties, I can get through this too. So drawing on their strength. Well, give us a moment now in silence to invoke whichever ancestors in our spiritual lineages Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, mindfulness, calling upon our spiritual ancestors, calling upon our land ancestors, calling upon our, our family lineage for strength, for support. Letting ourselves be enveloped by our ancestors like our friend envelops himself in his blanket every morning. So feeling the presence of those who care about us, who are supporting us, who know how to make it through very difficult times. Bowing with deep respect and gratitude to each of your ancestors, all of our ancestors. So I'm going to offer us a meditation now. This is teachings on how we can hold our grief 
how we can hold our pain. And it's a blend of a number of different teachers and practices. Um, And we'll begin by bringing up uh, a memory of care, of comfort, of positivity. So we'll begin the meditation by resourcing ourselves before we open to the grief. bringing up a memory that right away brings positive, warm feelings to arise. This could be something that happened recently or it could be something that happened further in the past. But a time when you felt safe, when you felt seen, when you felt appreciated, when you knew yourself to be connected, when you belonged. So just a little explanation about this. Research on trauma shows that we're not anxious because of hard thoughts, difficult thoughts themselves, but rather the difficult, hard sensations within our body. So we're accessing a time when our body was soft and receptive and relaxed. We evoke in detail the faces of those that helped us to feel this way, the words or the gestures of kind people in our lives. Or we imagine we bring to mind the details of beautiful places we've experienced because these ground us. So if it's not a person or a group that created this for you, but a place, then bring as many details of that place to mind. When we access these safe memories, it it calms down the difficult sensations in our body. So even in the midst of great distress, we can still bring up these memories and bring in balance into our system. So take some moments now to bring some memory to mind of a time you felt cared for, appreciated, loved, connected to others or to a pet or to nature. And as you bring up this safe memory, allow yourself to sense your own body. Just feel the goodness of that experience, filling your whole body. Swelling, growing stronger, more intense. Letting it really be alive in you. And this can be a really simple, small moment that just created a heart opening experience. Someone 
You didn't know who smiled at you on the bus or on the train. Someone who held the door for you. The whole story of the other person and, and you, it's not important, but just the moment that created that sense of, yes, opening to life. So the situation doesn't need to be a perfect one. The person doesn't need to be a perfect one. Just opening to the simplicity of the goodness of that moment. So feeling into the rhythm of your breath as you bring this memory to mind. Maybe the rising and falling of your chest or your belly. What sensations are you aware of as you relive this joyful, safe memory? Just letting it fill you and be really real in your body once again. And notice what that feels like. If gratitude arises, acknowledging gratitude. And now having resourced ourselves, we turn towards our grief. Grief is one of the heart's natural responses to loss. When we grieve, we allow ourselves to feel the truth of our pain the measure of betrayal or tragedy in our life. By our willingness to mourn, we slowly acknowledge, integrate, and accept the truth of our losses. Sometimes the best way to let go is to grieve. It takes courage to grieve, to honor the pain we carry. We can grieve in tears or in meditative silence in prayer or in song. In touching the pain of recent and long held griefs, we come face to face with our genuine human vulnerability, with helplessness and hopelessness. These are the storm clouds of the heart. Most traditional societies offer ritual and communal support to help people move through grief and loss. We need to respect our tears. Without a wise way to grieve, we only soldier on armored and unfeeling, but our hearts can't grow 
and learn from the sorrows of the past. As we turn in this meditation towards grief, take in the comfort of over a hundred people practicing here with you. Let yourself rest back in the support of the community Let yourself feel the support of the earth as Martin guided us at the beginning, rooting down into the earth. To connect with that source of support and energy and stability. and rising up towards the sky, accessing that freedom, that spaciousness. Sensing your breath. Feel your breathing in the area of your chest. Let the breath help you become present to what is within you. Take one or both hands and hold it gently on your heart as if you're holding a vulnerable human being. You are. Breathe in and out from the heart center in the center of your chest. Let the breath flow in at this point and flow out from this area. As you continue to breathe, bring to mind the loss or pain you are grieving. What we are collectively grieving, as well as what you might be individually grieving. Let the story, the images, the feelings come naturally. Hold them gently. Take your time. Let the feelings come layer by layer, a little at a time. Let the pain in through the heart center, the heart point, or let it pour out.
in touch with the grief of all those dying alone and afraid. All those who are ill and not able to get the care they need. All the migrants in India walking thousands of miles to get home, stranded without food, without water. Breathe, feel your body. What is it that you need to grieve? In touch with the people in refugee camps, prisons, detention centers, where social distancing is not possible, where water and soap sanitation are not guaranteed. Children who now have to work selling vegetables on the street in India because both parents have lost their jobs. All the people everywhere losing their jobs. All those who are lonely, cut off, isolated from others. Those who are stuck in unsafe homes. Those forced to go back to work in dangerous situations where their health is at risk. The growing wealth gap as more and more people lose homes, jobs, and billionaires amass even more wealth, a huge increase in wealth since the pandemic. And listening also for what it is that you as an individual need to grieve. What losses you have experienced. What plans have been interrupted. What connections have been strained or put on hold? What stress has in intensified? As you open up to allow these emotions in, sense what's calling your attention. What pain is asking to be felt, acknowledged? And just bring a receptivity there. Noticing what happens as you begin to be present with those sensations. Mm. 
maybe physical sensations. Notice if there's any attempt to push pain away or to pull away or to do something with the pain. Any kind of tensing in the body, in the emotions. If you become aware of physical, mental, or emotional reactivity to the pain, include that too in a kind, clear attention. There's no value in resisting or fighting aversion to pain. trusting that your awareness itself will open you to a space of more balance and freedom. Keep breathing softly, compassionately. Let whatever feelings are there, pain and tears, anger and love, fear and sorrow, come as they will. Allowing in the grief, the disappointment, the rage, the resentment into the heart center. Touch them gently. Let them unravel out of your body and mind. Make space for any images that arise. Allow all of it to be here. Breathe and hold it all with tenderness and compassion. Kindness for it all, for you and for others. Letting the grief know that you too belong. Allowing it to be here just as it is. Opening to it with gentleness, with interest.
Sensing if there's any change, any movement in the experience, more intensity, less intensity, noticing how it unfolds as you make space for it. And if the grief or fear becomes overwhelming, you can bring your attention back to the safe, positive memory of kindness that you brought up at the beginning. Or you could Bring awareness to any neutral part of the body, which could be the hands for some, the feet, the eyes, the lips. Just letting your attention rest more spaciously. And if the breath helps, breathe and rest in a place that has more ease for you. To help you regain balance, perspective, to build resilience. The grief we carry is part of the grief of the world. Hold it gently, let it be honored. You don't have to keep it in anymore. You can let it go into the heart of compassion. You can weep. This is from Anne Morrow Lindbergh. Go with the pain, let it take you. Open your palms and your body to the pain. It comes in waves like the tide and you must be open as a vessel lying on the beach, letting it fill you up and then retreating leaving you empty and clear. With a deep breath, it has to be as deep as the pain. One reaches a kind of inner freedom from pain, as though the pain were not yours, but your body's. The spirit lays the body on the altar.
Thank you, dear friends, for your practice. And I invite you, if you wish, to just gently return, maybe a stretch, whatever will help you to um, reconnect. So if anyone wishes to share in the chat one word or a phrase of anything that's alive for you now, having done this practice together, Oops. what you experienced, if you touched grief, or if you had challenges touching grief. Defrosting, openness, letting go, honesty, shifting, powerful forgiveness, challenges, holding, compassion, exhaustion. I acknowledge my sources of grief peaceful, couldn't settle in, grounding, touched into a deep well of grief, deep relaxation, many layered, acceptance, warm tears, kept falling asleep, releasing, vulnerable to life, freedom, tears, supported, weighted down, numbness, tears and calmness, repression. The shell metaphor, receive, receiving and releasing the sea. Strength, peaceful, remembrance, beautiful. Sorrow. And, and the well of grief is not just my own, it's collective caught, warm energy through the body, alive, giving it space. Broken open. So keep, keep feeling free to share if you haven't yet. Um, validating the grief, pain in my body, honoring all feelings. So whatever you experience, um, we want to welcome it. If it was f flowing, if there was numbness, if it was blocked, if it was difficult to access, if you got sleepy, all of that is um, to be held in a heart of compassion and mindfulness. Honoring situation of refugees, old streams of nourishment and song, peace. A bit blocked, heart opening, grateful for the peacefulness, blurring of edges, time for reconciliation, honoring my ancestors. Thank you everyone for continuing to share. So I want to offer some more reflections on how we might honor and hold our grief. That if we, if we can give our grief space to be with it, to let it come through us, then it can flow and it can move on. It can, that's what it wants to do. It wants, it has a journey and it, um, it wants to keep flowing. Emotion, the word is something that's in movement. 
An emotion is something that moves us. So we need to let our emotions have space to move. So if we refuse to grieve, if we shut our grief down, it stays stuck inside of us. And it may be that that gets passed on from generation to generation. So it's not even our grief that's stuck in us, but it may be our ancestors' grief. I was with Thai, also known as Thich Nhat Hanh, on a retreat for educators in Canada some years ago. And we met a man there who was a teacher and he shared that five years previously his father passed away, but he didn't want to stop and feel the, the grief of losing his father. And so he pressed on and just didn't, didn't take the time to grieve. And he became angrier and angrier as a, as a teacher in his home with his family. He, more and more things were irritating him and he had a shorter and shorter fuse. And it wasn't until he came to the retreat that he realized the anger was a manifestation of the ungrieved sadness from his father's passing. And he was able to make space for it, to really let it be. So what, what keeps us stuck and not able to allow grief in? It's scary. We might be afraid it will overwhelm us, but if we, if we turn towards it, it'll just engulf us and we'll lose ourselves in it. But if we, if we ground ourselves in our mindfulness, we can access something that is always strong enough to bear whatever emotion needs our care. So I had a chance to learn from a, a Tibetan Lama, John McCransky, on compassion, a course he was teaching on compassion. And he said that the root of all fear is based on the fear of our emotions. That what keeps us from really opening to our lives, whether it's our pain or our joy, is the fear of our emotions. But if we can really learn that every emotion can be known, can be befriended, can be understood, even the hottest, most sticky, most difficult ones, then we liberate ourselves from all fear. If we, if we learn we don't need to fear our emotions, that we have the capacity to meet them. So Bessel van der Kolk, the uh, trauma uh, therapist who wrote The Body Keeps the Score. He says, neuroscience research shows that the only way we can change the way we feel is by becoming aware of our inner experience and learning to befriend what is going on inside of us. So we need to feel it and make space for it and learn to befriend it. And that's how we can move through it. It doesn't, it doesn't get resolved if we try to shut it down, to numb it out. So a friend asked me, um, 
And she said, I noticed that because we carry the world inside of us, there's been so much sorrow, grief and suffering. And how can I be present with all of this? She said, it's, I know it's important not to dwell in grief, but rather to feel the grief. When I forget to grieve, I get stuck. So we all need to remember to grieve so that we don't get stuck, to be present with our grief so it can move through us. And I think part of the reason that we're in the trouble that we're in, in the larger sense, the pandemic, but also the climate emergency and Basically, you know, more and more societies that are becoming more and more dysfunctional at the level of government, at the level of economy, at the level of education, at the level of medical, and military. The reason we're in this trouble that we're in is that we're not grieving. We're in denial because we're shut down, we're frozen, we're numb in some way. When an animal is wounded, it needs to shake out all that fear and stress in order to calm its nervous system. And when we experience grief by really allowing it in also through our whole bodies, it can come through us and then it can move out if we don't allow it to move through us, it's still there. It's obstructing the pipes and then things can't flow. They can't function. So part of the healing process, I think for us individually and also collectively is to fully experience the grief. So in the fall last year, there was an online summit on collective trauma and there were beautiful talks. The organizer of the summit, Thomas Hubel, a German teacher, was talking about climate change. And he was saying that collective trauma is like snowflakes that fall and don't melt. So one layer of snow falls and it becomes impacted. That's like our ancestors' trauma. And then more snow falls and that becomes impacted. And so it's one generation after the next of unresolved trauma, of ungrieved grief. And, and now it's like block, a big block of ice of one generation of snow frozen onto the next. And so it's not just our trauma, our, our ancestors' trauma, it's our society's trauma the secrets that are still not made public, you know, the, the shame on, on a collective societal level that still hasn't been acknowledged. And he was saying that if we can heal that trauma, all of those different layers of trauma, we can heal our inability to act on climate change. And I would also say we can heal our inability to address the fundamental inequalities that this pandemic is exposing even more than, than before. So the, all the tools, all the solutions are already there to these problems. We have them already, but they're stuck under these layers of frozen trauma, grief and pain. And that keeps us from accessing the innovation, the freshness, the wisdom, the generosity of heart that are there in every single human being. So in our collective mind, we have all the collective solutions we already need, but they're stuck under layers of grief. Oh, beautiful. 
Someone has written, we need to melt so that our glaciers don't. Thank you. So we can't shovel this ice away, you know, in, in countries where there's a lot of snow, you see the snow plows just putting it onto the side of the street. It doesn't work that way. We, it has to melt, it has to release. We have to fully metabolize it. And then we'll find eventually in the metabolizing of that grief, everything we need to respond to all of these tragedies that we're facing. So, so grief is actually key. It's not something to avoid. We don't drown in it, but in being with it, we can release it. It can actually give us the answers we're looking for on the other side of it. So, you know, what we're facing right now, we cannot face alone as individuals. Our nervous systems weren't set up to face alone what we're facing right now as a species. So no generation of humans has had to face the level of complexity um, that we're facing now. The possibility of extinction. So with others in community, we need to open to this grief with great compassion to create spaces where we can address it together, where we can listen and nourish the positive things in us, the wholesome, where we also take time to see the good, to savor the beauty so that we keep a balance inside so that we're not overwhelmed when we open to the painful feelings. And when we do open to the grief, it actually leads us to feelings of deeper joy, deeper connection, like the melting that is allowing, you know, all of this to arise. It's, and then spring comes when the snow melts, right? We go through the difficulty, feeling the painful feelings, that actually allows us to touch deeper joy, deeper peace, deeper sense of connection. And when we access compassion, when we access the the safe moments that we did at the beginning of the meditation, it buffs up, it, it strengthens our nervous system so that we can, we can turn toward the grief and allow it in, allow it to melt and then integrate it, metabolize it. And so each of us can look at how we can take responsibility for the ways we are part of creating a society that doesn't work for the vast majority of humanity. And part of that metabolization is to see how is this all functioning and how am I a part of it? And what, what action will we take as a community to address the dysfunction, the destruction, And the pandemic, you know, is just a small taste of the whole house that's starting to collapse. It's just, it's just a microcosm of the larger macrocosm of of the unsustainability of how we've been living, how we're continuing to live.
So I have a, a dear friend and colleague, Kriti Kanko. She's a climate scientist from India, but living in the US. She's also a Zen um, Dharma teacher. And she leads groups that focus on grief, grief groups as part of her Zen spiritual teaching. So coming together to, to thaw out, to let the, the grief come out and melt, to, to cry, to journal, to speak about it, to write about it. And we can do this while remaining grounded. If we can stay connected to the emotion that needs to move through. Um, there's a, a teacher, Carol Wilson, who talked about her process of grieving her sister when her sister died. That she could see the difference between when she would get caught up in the story and the resisting it resisting that this had happened and um, and then she would tense up and it would be so much more painful. But if she could just let herself fully experience this wave, not resist it, it would come, she would just feel the pure sensation of this loss, of this longing, of this sorrow, but not getting hooked in, in the stories or you know, but just letting the fullness of the emotion wash through, then it, it would come out like that, like the wave coming out, leaving the vessel empty and clear. And she would feel this calmness and she had, she would do it over and over again, just letting the grief come, letting it go, not getting into, she, she noticed she could really see the difference if she wouldn't get into the thinking mind made suffering about it. Of, of trying to, you know, why, why did it happen this way? You know, the whole, um, the way we add onto the sorrow that's already there. But if she could just honor the rawness of the sadness, the loneliness, the releasing, and then she was really at peace as, as she grieved, you know. Um, it's the most natural and human of things to, to grieve. Even the Dalai Lama cried when his mother died. So human, so natural. So we want to release it. I also read somewhere that when we cry, stress hormones leave our body through our tears. So that's why we feel calmer. We feel more peaceful after a good cry. Our bodies are wise. We need to let them do the things that they're meant to do. They're meant to grieve. They're meant to cry. They're meant to shake and sob. All that just unsticks the things that are stuck inside of us, that motion. So Kriti was sharing with me in an interview I did with her about how grief is the other side of love. We only grieve that which we love. So when we let our grief open us, we touch how much we love. So we just need circulation. We need to be able to let what's down in the depths of our consciousness come up and not um, block it. So when our grief, when our fear, when our um, confusion, whatever it is, when it can come up freely into our minds, our mindfulness can be with it, recognize it, befriend it and then when it comes 
back, when it goes back down into the deeper layers of our mind, it's less potent. It's less reactive. It's less likely to hijack us when it comes again. So the more we can meet it with kindness, this, this thing that John McCransky said, if, that the root of all fear is the fear of our own emotions. The more we get used to meeting our emotions, letting them circulate, the more we lose our fear of them. And then, then there's no conflict when they arise. Then we can say, oh, hi, friend. Hi, grief. Hi, sadness. Hi, anger. I know you. I know how to be with you. I don't need to be afraid of you. I can make space for you. We can be here together. We can dance. And you can reveal to me what I need to know. So we begin to remove the inner landmines of reactivity, tension, fear. Every time we turn toward any strong emotion with kindness, we begin to disarm ourselves of what creates danger for us and for others. We become more and more safe the more we turn toward these painful emotions and let them move through us. There was a teacher I heard uh, share this story. She was teaching on a silent retreat. I was attending Spring Washam. She was on a long silent retreat a solo retreat and one night she had a dream that all of these weapons were like in a procession leaving her heart like guns and knives and cannons and missiles and every kind of weapon was just like a stream of weapons just flowing out of her heart in the dream being released so this sense of we can disarm ourselves as we learn to hold our emotions. And then the whole world becomes safer when we're not holding on to all these um, ways to hurt ourselves and hurt others. So as we give space to our grief, as we tend to our fear, it's a process of disarming. You can also think of it as debugging the software so that it's less likely to malfunction. We bring it up and then we let it go. And then we become less identified, less controlled by it. But it only happens, we only get released from it by fully letting it in. That's the paradox. By really opening to it, then it doesn't grasp onto us in the same way. Okay, I think it's time for our break now. So let's take a breath together. disarming breath. Thank you for your listening, for your attention. So in this time, we'll take five minutes and you're welcome to do whatever you need to do to take care of your body, stretch, go to the bathroom. And during this time, I invite you to ponder if there is a person or a group of people or a situation or a place that you're grieving that you want to bring to the group in a kind of prayer to get support around, to get the witnessing of. And that's what we'll do when we come back from the break is a small ceremony where we'll just honor and hold whatever grief people want to have honored. Um, and as we do that, we'll be listening to a song. So um, come on back in five minutes. And um, if anybody doesn't want a break, I'm happy to lead you in some practices that calm the nervous system.
just for a few minutes and then you can still uh, take a bathroom break as well. But this will send you out these exercises, so don't worry about missing them. So we'll see, see everyone in five minutes and those who, who wish. I see some people still sitting here. I assume you want to try this with me. All right. So these are some physical exercises we can do that help to calm the nervous system. And it's also called nurturing the vagal, the vagus nerve. This is uh, the main nerve that connects the brain to the body. It's important in regulating our breathing, our digestion, our heart rate, and when we calm the vagus nerve, it calms our fight, flight, freeze response. So we're going to do a sequence of moves, movements. And we'll start by massaging our ears. So this is where the, the vagal nerve starts development in the ears. The first thing we really orient towards as infants is hearing before we can see or hearing. Just let yourself massage your ears. Very good. Now if you have glasses, you need to take your glasses off. And the next thing is we'll place our hands over the eyes and just let your hands rest over the eyes. I guess with your palms sort of around the eyes. So you're not pressing on the eyeball. You're, you're just uh, making contact with the bones around your eyes. Just letting your eyes rest. You can take a breath here enjoying the darkness. Good. And then the next move is to hold your face. So like you cup your cheeks with your, uh, your palms are holding your chin and then your hands are along your cheeks. Really letting the comfort of that, almost as if another person were cupping your face with their hands. And also take a deep breath here. Good. And now we'll bring both of our hands and put them over our heart. And just let in the comfort of your warm hands on your heart. At least my hands are warm. And take a breath as you let your heart receive. And then we bring our palms down to our belly. both of our palms on our belly. So now that we can hear and see and feel and take in safety, we can begin to rest and digest down in the belly. And then the final practice is just to let the arms, the hands sit open on our lap. So palms up in a gesture of receptivity, opening to whatever it is that you wish to receive. Just taking a moment here in this position in stillness, connecting with what you wish to receive.
Wonderful, everyone. So just notice if you feel any different after doing those, that sequence than how you felt before. And if you have time in the future, and I'll send this out to everybody, you would do this like three times. So starting again with massaging the ears and the eyes and the cheeks, the heart, the belly, and then arms up on your hands up on your lap. I'll put this in the chat, the steps, but we'll send you the video so you can follow along also. But it's nice to do it three times through and then just see, see how that affects you. You can use it when you're feeling anxious or, or nervous, upset. There you go. Those are the six steps. So for some of you, it was powerful. I'm glad. Oh, good. You feel more settled, less carried away. All right. So welcome back from the break. Hopefully you all are all back. And now, um, Okay, so now I invite you all to begin to write down in the chat the names of people that you have lost or something that you're grieving. And, um, and while we do this, um, our friend is going to play a beautiful song by an Irish musician. This heart lies for you. A Oh, <laughs> 
Continuing to feel the body, feel the breath as the messages come in. It's witnessing and holding all of this loss. Thank you everyone for the courage to share your grief, to let it be here with all of us. held lovingly, held compassionately. So many heartfelt expressions. So as a way to bring a container and, and some kind of holding to all of these points of grief, I invite you to do this with your body or if you're not comfortable doing it with your body, you can visualize yourself doing it. That's also fine. but. I invite you to embrace yourself, to hold yourself, to hold your grief that you named, that others have named, and allow this sense of being held to come in to you from yourself. And wonderful Therapist and author Vesma Menekin, who wrote the book My Grandmother's Hands about healing racialized trauma. One of the things he encourages us to do is to rock. So if you feel comfortable, you can do this with your body, rocking front to back, side to side, rocking however you might feel you'd like to rock. Like if you were in a rocking chair or Whatever movement might be comforting to you, just holding your grief, holding the collective grief. Just let this happen. Let your body do what it wants to do. If it wants to be in stillness, let it be still. And close your eyes. Feel, feel yourself held, feel yourself being rocked, being loved in your grief. And if you want to add a tone, 
We'll bring in humming. Humming low notes is very soothing. But if you want to just hum a song that you like to yourself, like a lullaby, just let that happen. Any toning, any humming that wants to come. Mm. Honoring, honoring the pain, the loss. Letting the humming soothe you down into your depths of your being. Beautiful. You could do that as long as you want. If it feels good, just let it keep going. And whenever you're ready, you can come to stillness. Feel how trustworthy this embrace is, how reliable. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. So, we have some time now for questions. And a question came in from someone earlier about their daughter. Um, And I'll, I'll go to that one first. Um, I can't find it because there's so many things on the chat, but it was a question about someone whose daughter was grieving in this time of pandemic and lockdown and how to help the daughter to experience her grief um, and to, to release her grief. I think that was the question. One of the things that's so important about opening to our own grief is that we develop a skill for being with grief so that it's easier for us to meet someone else in their grief and hold them and help them feel okay to grieve because they know we're not afraid of their grief. So, so doing this for ourselves is a really helpful thing for others. And I think as you're with your daughter, you can, you could share the things that you found helpful from these practices or other practices that you know to do. And if she's open to them, you could guide her in them or you could do them together to support her to feel and allow her grief to move through. I don't know, you know, what her age is or what kind of relationship you have, but if she would allow you to, and if you would feel comfortable, you could hold her and rock her and lullaby her and let the physical connection also bring forth whatever she needs to release. That can be a beautiful act or some version of that, that that's appropriate for you and her.
Thank you for that question. Um, for those of you that would like, you can put your questions in the chat. And especially since the Irish Sangha has um, invited this event, I want to invite those in the Irish Sangha to um, not be shy and go ahead and ask questions. Because we'd love to make sure that we honor what you want to bring tonight. So I think this is a question or um, maybe a, a request for, to um, how to hold this from Jane Ann. I find it difficult to be soft and release when grief comes in, get very tense and it's all stuck in core and feels very toxic. Thank you for sharing this, um, Jane Ann. Um, I wonder how it would be for you to open to that, that tension, that stuck feeling in the core that feels very toxic. Would that be something that you would be open to allowing? So not having this idea that I should be soft, I should release, but saying, okay, so there's stuckness here, there's there's something, there's tension, there's a tox toxicity. Can I allow this? Can I open to this? Can I not make this wrong? And become curious about it, become interested in it. How does it function? Does it change? Does it get more intense in certain situations, less intense in others? Does it have a shape? Does it have a texture? Where does, where does it show up in my body? Can I bring mindfulness and friendliness to the experience of this stuckness in my body? So whatever it is that's there in response to the grief, we wanna meet that as much as we can with friendliness, with kindness, with interest, with care. Nothing is wrong about how we're approaching it. It's whatever's arising is what needs our care, what needs our attention. So I hope that that's something you might um, use to, to, to hold when that arises. Everything is the object of our meditation. There's no, it should be this way, it shouldn't be that way. Whatever's in the mind, that's what we bring our awareness to, our attention to. So thank you for sharing that. And Regina asks, how can I contribute to healing the collective grief in society? Thank you for that, Regina. Well, one, way is what I mentioned earlier is to practice to care for our own individual grief to make sure it's flowing um, it's circulating to, to keep practicing so that it's not getting stuck in us um, and if it is to do what we shared with Jane Ann to take care and be very friendly with the fact that it's stuck 
because that's what will help it become unstuck is when we don't resist it or fight it. So there's things we want to keep doing that maintain our own health individually. And then collectively, um, I think, you know, if you have a Sangha that you're a part of, a group that practices, inviting spaces where you all can grieve together, where you all can bring your, your pain and place it on the altar. Um, I'll just tell a story of a time that I had a very powerful experience of this traveling with Thai to Vietnam. We went with him three times. He was exiled from Vietnam for 40 years after calling for peace during the war. So it was a very big deal that he was able to come back each time we went. We, we went for three months. The second time we went, we did three ceremonies of healing in the north, Hanoi in the center, in Hue, and in Ho Chi Minh City in the south. We did three day long ceremonies. They were called Grand Requiem Masses, where finally for the first time in public, people had a chance to grieve those they had lost in the war. And these were ceremonies that prayed for anyone without discrimination. It didn't matter if they were from North Army, from the South Army, prayed for everyone without discrimination. And they were really powerful ceremonies. So everyone who lost someone submitted the name of the person when they died or when they thought they died. A lot of times they didn't know and where. And then, um, then we had these big altars all over the temples where we would, 10,000 people would come to each of these ceremonies for three days. We'd have huge altars, many altars, reams of paper staped on the wall and down the altar and down onto the, almost to the ground, just name after name after name after name, and then offerings on the altar. So it was a place for people to lay down their grief and have it be seen and acknowledged collectively. So there are things that we can think about in our own contexts that we may be able to do to honor, you know, whatever hidden griefs are there in the collective. Another powerful example of this is the lynching memorial in Montgomery, Alabama, started by Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative. I'll let you look it up, um, but, but go read about that. It's, it's called the Equal Justice Initiative, Montgomery, Alabama, amazing project of not letting the history of lynching get buried, but really bringing it out into the public to grieve it and name all the names of the thousands of people who were lynched um, throughout the country, not just in the South. So the, there, there are things we can do in very skillful, very profound ways to name the grief and release it collectively. Um, this is from Sarah Dawson, Taking Action. How do we take action in solidarity with those who need our support in difficult situations? Hmm. I think it's important to have a collective insight. As Tai would say, use your Sangha eye, use your community eye. It's, it's more, um, it's more precise and perceptive than our own individual eye. So that might be a question to bring to your community. Is how to take action in solidarity with those who need support. There's many good organizations. I, I regularly give money to organizations that I believe in and that are helping people who are, you know, immigrants that are being detained or that are working on um, prison reform or legal funds to bail people out of jail who are just stuck there because they just don't have money for bail. So we can give money, we can sign petitions, we can just learn about issues that are going on so that our hearts can be open and connected to the suffering in other places or even in our own communities. And maybe we can join an organization, we can volunteer, we can make phone calls, we can, you know, 
do whatever activism is uh, would support that group. So there's many ways, um, but we want to do it from a mindful place, from a place of compassion, from a place of love, not out of fear, not out of resentment or anger as much as possible. Although anger is not bad, it's just we want to channel it in a way that um, helps us to be most effective. Hmm. Kathleen has written um, to me that, that Kathleen writes, loss of mom two weeks ago, find hard to grieve with businesses. I think, I think you're sharing, Kathleen, that you have a lot of work running businesses and it's hard to grieve the death of your mom. Um, I think sometimes it's like that, like we don't have a lot of open space and time. And so we, we, we let in whatever quiet moments there might be, even going to the restroom or when you wake up in the morning or when you lie down to sleep or even just taking a, a short break from your work, just allowing whatever you can to arise. And if tears come, or if you know you want to journal, or just looking out at the clouds, looking at the sky, looking at a tree, just connecting with something bigger than you that helps you to hold and feel what you're feeling. I understand when there's a lot going on, it's, it's not easy to have space to grieve but the intention to do it will help you to find space to do it in the, the little spaces that might be there in between your other responsibilities. Sending you a lot of care, Kathleen. This is from Natalie who writes, how to practice with my father who starts each morning talking caustically and in attack mode. Mm. So one thing I would invite you to ask yourself is, how do you, um, what's your response to that? Um, and of course, a very human response would be <laughs> to be angry or to feel defensive or to feel reactive in some way, that that's really not very pleasant behavior. But we create more suffering when we resist or when we judge or when we, um, you know, when we basically push against what's coming at us. It doesn't mean we don't create boundaries and to protect ourselves and, you know, um, but if we can notice our own reaction, we can be mindful of and care for that. So if we feel hurt, then we bring mindfulness and care to our hurt. If we feel defensive and angry, <clears throat> we bring mindfulness, friendliness to get to know our anger and our hurt better. And the closer we come to our own emotion, <clears throat> the easier it may be to then help your father to recognize his emotion. And so we might be able to speak calmly to, to him and say, you know, when you speak like that, it really hurts. I wonder if you might share with me what's going on for you. Or, um, You know, I'm hearing a lot of pain in what you're saying. Um, can I support you in any way? So we might be able to find a way past the attack mode to address the heart that is quite tender underneath all of that attack. Because people don't usually do those things if they're not suffering in some way. So we might 
as we learn to come closer to our own emotions, we might be able to listen more deeply to hear the suffering behind the attacking words and help our father um, to suffer less. So this is from Jane Ellen, and we're at two hours now, so I'll, I'll answer um, maybe this one and one more, if we can go over by a little bit, and then we'll, we'll finish up with some announcements and a closing. Jane Ellen asks, how can we help activists like Extinction Rebellion to get in touch with their grief? Um, so similar to some of the other questions, um, I think uh, creating spaces where people can share from the heart where there's no agenda to get something done, but really like a unburdening the heart sessions where people can just share, maybe just like we did, just putting the names of what we're grieving to music. People could write them down, put them on a piece of paper, put them in a bowl. We, in, on retreats I lead for teenagers, we have a meta bowl on the altar and we keep paper and pen by it and throughout the whole week people can write down their worries the people they're concerned about the situations that are distressing them they fold it nobody reads it they just put it in the meta bowl and it sits on the altar and everyone holds that with care with tenderness during the retreat and, and at the end we burn the papers but that might be something some even an anonymous way to give people a chance to express um, their pain. Heather writes, how do we support loved ones who use intoxicants to deal with grief? Um, so we want to be compassionate with ourselves in this situation because it's a hard situation to be in. We want to be compassionate with our loved ones who are obviously suffering a great deal and turning to intoxicants to uh, relieve their suffering. And I think the best thing we can do is hold our own emotions with mindfulness and with care and really get to know our own internal landscape of how it is for us that they are using intoxicants. Is there disappointment? Is there fear for their well-being? Is there a sense of being betrayed? And really take good care of whatever those emotions are. And then the more we spend time listening to our own inner landscape, the wisdom will arise from those emotions that have now become revealed, what's really behind them. And we'll know what, what would be more skillful to do um, in response to our loved ones. Um, because it really depends on the situation, on who they are, on how our relationship with them is. So listening to our own emotional response, getting calm enough to hear what is it that deeply concerns us, and then what might be a way that we could express that in a way that they might be able to hear us, or how might we water the seeds of well-being, of ease in our loved ones so that they have more resilience and less, um, less tendency to depend on an intoxicant. That's difficult, but it's possible too. So thank you all for the questions. I'm um, sorry we can't get to all of them. Um, 
I will make sure to read them though. And uh, I'll, I'll be doing more of these online teachings. Um, I think June 3rd, I'll do another one for the Australian Sangha. Maybe I can try to address some of these in future teachings. But I wanted to let you know about some other upcoming events that I have, and we'll also be sending this out in a um, email with a recording from tonight. Um, and I'll just put, I'll put in the chat um, I'm, I'm leading a retreat June 18th through the 21st, and it's called An Embodied Response to Coronavirus and Climate Chaos. And it's an interplay retreat, which is movement, storytelling, um, body wisdom, uh, a chance to really get in touch with um, active, creative, ways to understand, the, to release and access the wisdom of the body. So that, those are the links. One is this retreat, which is a sliding scale retreat. That's the link to learn about it. June 3rd, I'm, I'm giving a teaching um, as part of the Engaged Mindfulness series. It's a monthly webinar with two other teachers on June 3rd I'm leading and it's on inclusiveness and intimacy, medicine for polarization and privilege. And then June 4th I'm offering a 90 minute workshop by donation called Interplaying with Joy and Grief and the link there will lead you to um, register for that. It will be on Zoom. So once again, I'll put the information for donations in the chat as well. And then we will come to a close. Um, taking a few breaths together quietly, just sensing into what it is that we have received here, what we've brought into our heart, what we're taking with us from this time. And we offer up the merit, the wholesome energy of our practice together to benefit all beings everywhere. May all beings know peace. May all beings be safe and protected. May all beings awaken to their true nature. May all beings be able to metabolize their grief and touch deep joy. So as we exit and finish the call, you're most welcome to put some words in the chat. What are you leaving the call with or you can turn on your mics and say goodbye. You might hear a lot of people. Oh, and Martin has something to share before we do that. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm glad not to be competing with 130 voices. Um, one, thank you very much. I deeply appreciate your deep sharing of the heart, Carajul. And um, I really encourage people to go to carajul.com. It's very easy to find. It's a very um, unusual name and very easy to find on the web page. And if you have difficulty donating, um, you will actually find a way to donate there. And I say this because I often attend talks and I mean to donate and then I don't and then I feel guilty. So absolve yourself of any guilt and just go and donate. Um, thank you to Plumline, Mindfulness Ireland, Flowing Together Sangha. 
thank you very much for all of your attention. And actually, my own husband is locked in the bedroom for the last two hours. You have people locked in your bedrooms for the last two hours. And pets, I see them. So thanks to all of those people that allowed us to attend. Deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Unmute and wave goodbye. And thank you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great to see your faces. Thank you. Yeah, nice. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Curtis. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Long goodbye. Yeah. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Yes. Wonderful to see you, Kyra. Vivian, mm. wonderful to see you in fall. Yes. You know. So happy to be with the Irish Sangha. Thank you. Thanks, Vivian. Paul, for Thank joining. You. Thank you. Good to see you all. Take good care. Be safe. Big hug. Thank you. Virtual big hug. <laughs> right back to you. <laughs> My heart is full. Okay, guys, let those partners and husbands and wives out of their rooms. <laughs> let's, let's be generous to these people. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Sarah Jane. Good to see you, Pat Mellon. Maria. Thank you. Hello, Neve. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Catherine. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. It's been really beautiful, really special. Thank you. Good to see you, Catherine. <laughs> thank Good you, Jack and Sarah Jane. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Jack and Sarah Jane. Really nice to do this with you. I had a little message come up on my phone yesterday and said, uh, should we end every Zoom with some music like from the Oscars just to have a grand finale and a sending off? So uh, mm. I do it with deep gratitude. Mm. Thank mm. you, guys. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to assume you've fallen asleep soon, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm copying and pasting the questions, but I think when we get the recording, they'll stay, right? It's, yeah, it is, as so, far as so I'm I aware. I don't need to copy them, no. I guess. Okay, good, I'll, I'll find them. <sighs> okay. Um, will we turn off the recording, Kyra Jewel? Yeah. Yeah, shall I stop? I'll stop. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Okay.